Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, John Coleman, and uh, one of the uh, upsides and downsides of my name is if you Google me, you'll find like millions of John Colemans and uh, conductors and all that kind of stuff. So if you're trying to check me out, you can use the link tree, I guess, um, or just add the word agile after my name and you should see me coming up then. Um, so I'm here to talk about executive agility. And I have three clients at the moment, and uh, we're not always blessed to be in the right position in terms of uh, helping executives. And I will refer to some stories as I, as I go through this, but there's one client at the moment that I am actually playing this with, and there are previous clients that I would have as well. And the, the overall metaphor here is hit delete, like hit delete on the keyboard. Really, really simple. Uh, how can we make things uh, more simple, actually? So maybe I need to explain what I mean by an executive. Someone who is appointed or given the responsibility to manage the affairs of an organization and the authority to make decisions. Because a lot of the time I hear people saying they're executives, but they might be minus four or minus five in the organization. I'm just trying to be really clear what I'm kind of talking about here. And to give a few examples, it could be someone at CXO level, it might be even minus one, could be a change agent even actually interacting uh, with an executive. And really the talk today is aimed at uh, change agents who are actually dealing with executives. Um, in terms of what supports are out there, there's lots of supports for people and teams and teams of teams and all these wonderful things. There's even leadership training, but a lot of the leadership training that's out there is really aimed at uh, mid-level managers. And that's fine, it's all very useful. Um, you see lots of things about servant leadership and so on, but very little tangible uh, practical things that you can try uh, with executives. And that's what I'm trying to target a little bit uh, today. Just to set the scene, um, one might misunderstand the, uh, the presentation thinking that I'm offering recipes. I'm not. Um, context is king and all these kind of things. Uh, I'm not saying this is linear. Um, so you'll see a level of progression. Uh, you might have executives who are demonstrating behaviors at a really high level of agility, but actually there are some lower level behaviors that are really holding them back in terms of actually holding, holding the organization back, I would say. And you're probably talking to the wrong guy if you want to talk about buying Agile in a box. I'm not that guy, okay? So um, there are lots of people who do that and that's fine, um, but really what I'm about is trying to grow authentic, sustainable agility. And we're really trying to release that, unlock that, grow it, and not just make some progress for a couple of years and having it rolling it back, but trying to have some different behaviors with executives so that the change actually sustains and goes into the future. Uh, a few other things I just want to mention. Uh, there were a couple of other talks, really good talks uh, by Wilbert and Colleen yesterday on how you, uh, how you uh, present your energy with executives and so on and how you kind of see through their eyes and so on. And there was a lovely talk from Frederick this morning about the range as well in terms of what skills do you bring to bear? How can you, instead of almost being um, inferior in the conversation, how can you kind of walk together as Frederick was saying to me yesterday, that's not what my talk about is about today. I'm assuming that you're gonna to talk to people like Frederick and Wilbert and Colleen and I can help with that kind of stuff as well. But really today, it's about what are the behaviors, some of them that might be impeding our agility. That's really what I'm trying to nail uh, today. And I'll be asking you some questions as we go along. And uh, one thing I just wanna confirm as well is that because it's not recipe based, when I say hit delete, it doesn't mean never do that thing. Like, for example, even though I'm a kind of a Kanban guy and, you know, obviously into pull and all that kind of stuff, I'm not saying never do push. So there's always uh, reasons behind what you do, but it, it's kind of more like, can we have more stories like this and less stories like that? So that's the way I'd like you to see uh, the, the talk today. So 
it's kind of a coincidental that there's a kind of a spectrum of colors here and I don't want anybody thinking this is anything to do with reinventing agile or spiral dynamics or that kind of thing. It's just a spectrum of behaviors. And what I want to do is I want to start with the real basic ones because in my experience, we're actually not pushing an open door with transparency. We're not pushing an open door with outcomes. A lot of people say we should start with why, and what you'll see in this talk is that sometimes goal orientation comes a little bit later. Because if the executive is dealing with a situation where they've got a basic plumbing problem, a lot of the time they want to fix their plumbing before they'll even talk to us about goals. Um, so let's get started. Something wrong with my clicker here. <laughs> Click. Yeah, Houston, we have a problem. Ah, here we go. <laughs> so the first set of deletions that I'm uh, recommending, internal demands, demanding this work will be done by a day. I, we know that there are some external forces. We need to comply with the law. We've got all these other things going on. Uh, fixed price, fixed scope uh, type initiatives. Uh, that are really demanded on teams, teams really having no say, not even consulted about uh, when they could deliver this. A really interesting one is delayed minutes. Uh, I had one recently where I, I came across a situation in an orga organization where they were delaying the minutes by about three weeks. Three weeks. So the game was, Let's say we're together here, the people in the front table, and we agree something in a meeting. Yeah, we all agree, everything's great. But the game was, if it's not in the minutes, it's not agreed. And so, surely if the people in the climate change conference can agree the minutes on the day that they finish the conference, after a very difficult conference, surely executives can do that in, in the end of a session. So in their sessions, can we be talking about, you know, can we just do these uh, immediately? I'm gonna talk about some alternative behaviors later because if you delete things you might leave a vacuum and uh, you need something a bit more healthy to fill that vacuum as well i'm suggesting um, lack of prioritization within the capacity i often see leaders saying we prioritize everything but they still have two years of work to do within one year so that they have any idea about how many things they can deliver within a year uh, de decisions with perfect information and another one would be complacency in relation to improvement and learning. We don't need to learn. Um, so these are some suggestions that I have. And what I'm curious about from you is, if these behaviors were in place, what do you think you'd see? If an executive is doing these things, what do you think we'd see? Our sense. Any suggestions? Please go ahead, Fred. Caution, compliance. Compliance. Caution. Caution. Lack of direction. Lack of direction. Control. Control. And I also believe that if you let this continue, teams won't see the point of agility. We're asking teams to be agile. And we're dealing, sometimes we're dealing with really enthusiastic people that really do want to make a go of this. But if they can see they're within a value stream and they're doing some work when they're handing it over to somebody else and those people actually don't care, not that they're not nice people, they just work for a different department. They've got different priorities. And it's not kind of going across that way. And so it just doesn't feel good. And so people are saying, what's the point of me measuring my cycle time when actually it doesn't matter? It's like it doesn't matter. So how do we kind of move on from this? So some suggestions, how about we do the minutes immediately? Why not just make that part of the agenda? A lot of you have heard of disagree and commit, I'm sure, and I've, I've, had, I've had this in a big oil company with really high functioning executives. And when I came in, they couldn't make any decisions. So one of the first things we talked about is how do we make decisions? 
and health and safety was important in this situation. So we said, okay, we need to be unanimous if somebody could die or if it was going to be detrimental to the company. But other than that, 70 percent of us agree. Let's just commit and just move forward. And actually, do you know what? Some of the people who disagreed actually were relieved by that because they needed to politically dis to disagree, but actually personally they agreed with the decision. So it was uh, quite a good unlock. Instead of maybe the leader committing to some particular date, how about more, more regular forecasts? Uh, we're not even talking about good flow here. I am talking about reviewing your flow somehow. And you could go, for, for example, to one of Daniel's or Pratik's classes on Agile Metrics. You don't even have to be doing Kanban to do those workshops. And just understand, how, how is the work going through our system? And as Jim Benson said to me when I was talking to him about personal Kanban, just ask people what's frustrating them. We have to be very careful going in with flow metrics when actually there's some systemic problems and there's some things that aren't very humane about what's going on in the organization. And so ask them, and there will be no shortage of opinions, by the way, about what people are frustrated about. The problem is usually that we've been accepting what people have been frustrated about for so long that it's just been taken for granted that this is just how bad things are around here. And maybe try things instead of waiting for that perfect information. Just give something a go. I had an example only yesterday where there wasn't really a uh, uh, conclusion about what the way forward was. And thankfully, some voices of reason came through and said, let's just try one of, these, one of these options and let's just see how that goes. And thankfully, that's what they're doing. And uh, one of Andrea's colleagues and my colleagues and Frederick's ex-colleagues as well, uh, said, you know, why can't we, uh, why can't we le learn every day at five o'clock? And I was thinking, I just did a little pivot on his idea and said, how about nine minutes of learning at 9 a.m.? How about we don't um, have any meetings booked for the first 15 minutes every day and we just look at YouTube videos or books or whatever? You could expand it. It's not too much, is it? Nine minutes at 9 a.m. Simple little things that you can do. So then if we move on to the next set of deletions, the first one is really, really damaging. And I had some teams uh, in the last 18 months who were making really good progress. Their flow was stabilizing, their work wasn't aging, their work was making a difference, their customers were happy. And then they promoted someone from another part of the company in who was like a command and control person from hell. And it really changed things and it put us backwards and now because we've got all these things going on, like the war and so on, this guy has excuses about why he should behave the way he should behave. And it's really, really damaging. Inflicting help on people. We talk about that as coaches and as mentors. Uh, a guy called uh, Tom Meller, who you might have heard of, one of the first ever certified scrum trainers, he said to me one day, don't ever give advice unless people are asking for it. But he was giving me advice when he told me that. <laughs> Um, maybe instead of passive risk management, being a bit more active and putting that stuff, if you've got backlogs, putting them into the backlogs is risks that need to be teased out. Instead of broadcasting at town halls, maybe it needs to be more about going or walking around and listening. And a lot of leaders are really blind to growth constraints. And at lower levels of agility, some executives think they can scale their way out of any problem or outsource their way out of any problem. And often what I have to do is I have to kind of demonstrate, sometimes through looking at how the value flows, that maybe all the work that we all do in this room is depending on these two people here, David and Andrea, because they've got really unique skills. We can't go any faster than they, than they can. What have we done about that? One that's a real signal for me, a perfect utilization, hurting them, keeping people busy. But the other one is focusing on star performers. When the executive is telling me, you know, as long as I've got Andrea on the team, everything's going to be great. If I've got Fred, everything's going to be cool. We've only got one Andrea, we've only got one Frederick. It's not scalable. And it's kind of rewarding individual performance. We could talk about that later on. Uh, this is not something we can do to the stage, but trying to focus more on the team. And by the way, in terms of football, I think some of the, in, uh, like soccer, for example, I think some of the more successful teams of late in the last five years have been team, uh, teams where the managers cared more about the team and it wasn't about buying a key player who's going to make a big difference. And when I see 
teams saying, if you got this player, it's going to make a big difference. I kind of know where they are. It's kind of, I think even Alex Ferguson would struggle in the current environment because that's the way he was. Uh, another one would be a lack of discipline. Uh, so we're, we're really trying to encourage people to visualize their work. And how about executives leading by example? Uh, when people have a daily, for example, I mean, it's the last opportunity to update your, update your board, isn't it? You didn't update, oh, I didn't have time to, well, just do it now, just drive the car or move it or whatever. Oh, I'll do it later on and I'll say, oh, I have to blah, blah, blah. And I think a leader really needs to set example uh, with that. And so what I'm suggesting is that if you don't get rid of these deletions, if you don't deal with these deletions, well, get rid of these behaviours, hat tip to Robert Keegan and Lisa lasco Lahi. They've got a book called Immunity to Change, and in there they have this metaphor of one foot on the gas, uh, uh, one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas. So you're trying to go fast and go slow at the same time. You're kind of not making much progress. So some suggestions. How about re recruiting, promoting with agility in mind? How about walking around regularly, not just having a royal tour where people put up posters? I mean, I was with clients where they did that. They asked me to put up posters. I put up Deming's management principles behind it. That was a bit sneaky. And uh, maybe uh, getting a common understanding of how the work flows, not just you understanding, but do our people understand how the work flows? Uh, letting non-experts start the work, not, not always uh, letting the, uh, have, focusing on the, the experts always doing the work. Because if you think about it, when the experts are always starting the work, we're really constrained by the experts and we, we need to be kind of improving that labour liquidity. And getting more informed on complexity, and depending on your context, there might be some different way of sense making. It might be the Vanguard method if you're into service delivery, for example. It might be Conevin if, you, if you're not really sure which way to go next. And leading by example. So we've got two sets of deletions so far. And now we've got the third set. And here we've got local optimization. Do you know what I mean by local op optimization? Just focusing on the agility of one team and not really seeing that we're making a difference. Short term suppliers. Uh, I had a client and they, were, uh, they thought it was a great idea to do a tender every uh, nine months to swap out the vendor. The knowledge was just gone out the door every nine months. Uh, maybe while push is sometimes needed, uh, maybe this is the time to finally stop that push if we can. And a lack of goal orientation. Did you notice that it didn't start with why? I'm only talking now about goal orientation. Because I find that one of the things I'm trying to do is when I'm meeting an executive is I need to be kind of meeting them where they are. And I find talking about goals, a lot of the time, we're just like passing ships. It's like, what are you talking about? I committed to delivering these things. Ruthlessness with people. It's okay to be ruthless with value, but not with people. You need to be deleting that at this stage. And commitment in Scrum, of course, is not a guarantee, but a lot of executives think that commitment is a guarantee. This means we're doing, doing our best. You, you would think that we would have cognitive diversity, but at this point, we are really to deal with complexity. We understand that we actually need to finally make sure we have lots of fresh thinking, not just getting the experts to focus on the work, but actually maybe we need to uh, get some new ideas in terms of how we do things and stopping imposition at this point. If we don't delete these, I'd love to hear your opinion. What would we see and what would we sense? Uh, sense of fear. Sense of fear, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, things happening locally, but not system-wide. Tons of work created, but no one else needed to do it. Yeah, a list of stuff. I, use, I usually use bad language for that, a something list. <laughs> Lots of stuff to be done. Yeah, and uh, it's a bit of a strange environment, because for me, I think the environment is going to lack, the place is going to lack humanity. 
if you don't have this. How, how can people even think about 80-20? Have you heard of 80-20? You try to achieve 80% of the outcomes with 20% of the outputs. How can you even do that if you don't have goals? We're not, we, in the previous set of deletions, we weren't even there. It was about, okay, we need to get this stuff done. We need to, we need to chop down all the trees. We're not even sharpening the saw. They don't even know what they're doing. So some suggestions, let teams coordinate. Focusing on aging, I won't read them all. But finally at this point, we're talking about discovery, discovering to deliver. You can do that earlier, of course, and I'd recommend you do that. Uh, but I find that people who are so focused on their plumbing problems aren't thinking about experimentation. I actually normally find that it's only when goals come about and then the executives can see they can't get everything that they want, then they realize, oh, we need to figure out a simpler way of achieving those outcomes, and then 80-20 comes in, and then we're thinking about experimentation. It unlocks a lot, actually, when you, when you do that. And see what, the, what difference the outputs make, and maybe tweak them. There are more, and this is a whole spectrum. And if I was to kind of move on, if we took kind of do a little bit of a fast forward on this, I mean, you've got efficiency tunnel vision, for example, Ever hear, ever hear executives talking about efficiency? And it's a little flag for me that let's squeeze more juice out of the teams. That needs to be deleted at this point. Big bets is the big norm. Over milking the cow, as in that's a metaphor for the products that you already have. Uh, are you so committed to that? I had one client recently say, oh, we've had the best two years ever. That's like an alarm bell for me. It's like, uh, okay. <laughs> Um, people in the wrong seats on the bus. Um, individual meritocracy, we need to be deleting this at this point to bring about uh, team oriented and team of teams oriented and stopping this attitude of build it and they will come. I mean, we should have been doing that at the start. But we had to get a lot of, in my experience, we had to get, a lot of rid, of, get rid of a lot of the basics before people would even be talking to me about this. When I hear a customer, uh, customer saying to me, oh, we need to be consumer centric, we need to be customer centric, I know that they're not. If you have to talk about it, it's not there. It's like the values in the wall, isn't it? And so you don't have these, it's like a feature factory. You ever hear a feature factory, like making sausages? Uh, I've got more. Uh, what about these? Uh, we, we don't use any data for our decision making. We're not doing any 80-20. We're happy to let teams just swim in the horrible processes that we gave them. We haven't actually simplified them, deleted them, decluttered them. Uh, we allow people to grow horizontally. It's not just about going that way. And this better, faster, cheaper attitude finally goes. We're thinking, OK, what's the next thing? What's the next goat or sheep or whatever we need to find after the cow runs out of milk? And shouldn't we always have technical excellence? But at this stage, this needs to be deleted, the lack of technical excellence. And it goes on. You could lose your customers. <laughs> you keep doing this, you could lose your customers. You're thinking about the past. We're creating new leadership positions. Uh, really, you should have uh, you should leaders without leader being a position, really. Um, I have a client at the moment who's really struggling to deliver customer value because they're so focused on dependency management. They haven't finally restructured to make that easier. So for me, it's about behaviors need to be deleted and replaced with more healthy ones. And when you get to a certain point, the structure is something that people can see needs to be changed as well. And then that drives new behavior uh, change. Ego. Uh, I hope we're not getting executives for massive egos like we did in the past. Backlogs in the Vanguard method, they don't use backlogs. You just ask the customer, what do you want next? So uh, you can see it's getting very agile at this stage. Um, so I'll ask you, um, how slow or quick do, do we need to be with executive agility? What do you think? We've got way too many sign-off stuff that has to go through, so that takes ages to get through. Yeah, a lot of people tell me, oh, we're, we're evolving and we're, 
it's one inch at a time and all that kind of, and actually it's really one millimeter at a time. And the problem with that is that we basically, we're on an egg timer, we're not sure if we realize this. There's a window of opportunity because it's difficult for us to find people who are really, really enthusiastic about change. And even those people start losing hope if the executives don't move a bit faster. So I put it to you, my hypothesis, my hypothesis is that essentially, uh, if we don't work faster with executives, so there's, this is where the tension is because we need to wait for pull, but at the same time, we, when you're looking at a slow moving car crash, uh, sometimes it, it creates tension for me as well in terms of how I interact uh, with the executive. Uh, to put it simply, sometimes I act like the bad cop and uh, we don't always need bad cops, but sometimes if you want to have a maintain your relationship with your executive and you want to be positive and how can help you to be successful, all these kind of things, well, sometimes you need someone to almost give them a little bit of a red eye actually that, yeah, you're, you're being very agile in your area, but in terms of the how the value is flowing through this organization, we've got big problems here. And so that's my hypothesis. And my, I hypothesize as well that if we don't delete these behaviors, the executive will be deleted. Not because of me, but they'll be under so much pressure because they're not delivering the results that are needed. And if the executives aren't deleted, I think we shouldn't be surprised if the organization gets deleted. Lots of deletions. But start with the basics and meet people where they are, but maybe don't meet them in the basement. So this talk, uh, a lot of people who I named here, they've inspired me with different conversations, deep conversations I've had over the last five years. Uh, they're not to be blamed for the content <laughs> because they probably don't agree with the way I put it together, but I'm very inspired uh, by all of these people. And I continue to be inspired by these people. If you want to find out more, uh, I've got a podcast, it's called Exagility. And uh, a lot of executives, they get confused. Uh, everyone has a book and they're doing keynotes and all that. So which model do I pick? There's 20 different people saying I should pick this model. And so I interview these people. So I help people to understand what they're actually doing. And then you maybe can make sense of what they're doing. But in the in-between episodes, I'm also doing these deletion episodes as well, little nuggets. Okay, so this deletion, uh, talking to executives uh, like, like John Carter, for example, from uh, Expose, how do we uh, improve innovation and so on and so forth? Any questions? Please. A uh, question about executives. I just learned, for example, that their uh, average time in the company is around three years, and then they look for an exit. And in my current company, where we are trying to organize ourselves to be a little bit more agile, between me and the CEO, there were five levels. Four of them are leaving before September. So only my immediate manager is staying. And yeah. people are commenting that we can try to do the things, teams are trying, but everybody above us doesn't have incentive to change. Yeah. And the system is not changing, so we are doing only local optimizations. Yeah, I can completely uh, empathize with that situation. Uh, one of the things that I check in with when I join a client is how long, how long has that executive been in place? If they've been in place for, say, something like three years, like you've mentioned, I'm probably thinking that they're maybe towards the end of their uh, their tenure, if you like. And I kind of pick and choose my moments in terms of do I, um, I usually exercise patience waiting for the next person uh, to come in. I've made some fantastic progress in banks, for example, uh, and then you get a new leader, new broom. And uh, I, remember I had one case where the next person absolutely hated me, put the phone down on me, all sorts of weird things. We're friends now, it, it's, it all had a happy ending. But it was a, a difficult period for me as a change agent. And Frederick mentioned earlier on, for example, about you know how do we stay alive as change agents? And that was a really difficult time for me. And so you might need to pick your battles and you might need to be careful with your timing. 
how long is that executive in their role? So when I was in a large oil company, for example, I was quite inspired that it was a new leader. He seemed to be saying the right things, but I was trying to see if he was going to behave the right way. Um, and uh, he was only in there for like nine months already. So I felt, OK, there's probably three years of runway here in front of us so we can maybe make some progress. The key thing, though, is um, and uh, this is important. The key thing is to try by doing these deletions, we're trying to make sure that the change is sustainable. If you don't do these deletions, my hypothesis is that no matter how good your executive is and how, how, how much progress she makes, it will all be unraveled when the next person comes in who's trained by whatever business school who doesn't talk about any of these things that I talked to you about today. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, can I complete really quickly this Please. one and ask you a question? Yeah. So when after AirAsia, I was looking for another chief transformation officer role, um, uh, Egon Zender, which is an executive recruiting firm, told me, stop trying to talk to CEO, talk to boards, because CEOs will stay two or three years, and they will not back the agenda of transformation. So that's one thing you can think about. Another thing is there are executives that stay longer in an organization and they represent a pivot point, but also they represent a, a gravity center. So they may actually be really, really hard to move, but once they move, everything moves because they have authority. Uh, so that's one thing to think about. The question I would like to ask you, because I know you, you spend time on that, is when we delete a behavior and um, we want to replace it by another behavior, what are some examples of how you can help an executive put something in uh, to replace? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good question, Fred. So uh, I have a recent example, um, fast moving consumer goods, goods company, and they were planning to plan two years of work for 2022. So whatever we got done in 2021, they were going to, do, going to do that twice over in 2022. So put together a portfolio Kanban board. And thankfully, I use a tool called Kanban. It's a wonderful tool. And all the data rolls up. And I was able to see how many there, a very project-oriented organization. And I was able to see not only how many work items go through on a month-to-month -month basis, but also how many projects go through and I, I was sensible enough as well to have work item types and project types. So if anybody said, yeah, but this project is different, I was able to deal with that noise as well. And I was kind of accepting as well, though, that there's still noise in the system in terms of how many projects. Yeah, OK, do by month. That's maybe a bit too noisy because of how long the projects take. But if I looked at it maybe over quarters and semesters and years, I could see how much, what their capacity was. And as w when we did that, we broke up their backlog. We, we said, OK, now, next, later. They just didn't realize we were doing that. And then what's all currently in the system? And then you know, what do we get done? And so when they planned their work for Q1 of 2022, it was based on the profile of Q1 of 2021. I'd still prefer that would have been even lower to allow a little bit of slack for the stuff they hadn't even thought about. But that was major progress. And that was without any, without any education on flow. Uh, didn't, didn't talk about Kanban or any of that kind of stuff, didn't use any jargon. Just asked, well, okay, you don't have a flat profile in terms of how much stuff you get done. Around April, you get more stuff done than you do in September. This time last year, you got this much stuff done. Why do you think you can do double that this year? And it was really, uh, what they did was they, they didn't quite sequence the work, but they made sure that the number of projects for the quarter was uh, less than or equal to what we had last year. And also gave them the space as well to deal with new ideas during the quarter as it happened, as you would expect. Does that help? I, uh, I think that's it for, uh, I think it's lunchtime. Uh, okay, that is over there. one last question here maybe? Yeah. Is that okay? When I'm preparing for lunch, you can start. Like, yeah. Uh, based on your experience, which deletions are the easiest to progress with the people you worked with and which deletions have you found to be the hardest to progress? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. If I just jump back to the deletions, I start with the basics. And the most difficult one to delete is com complacency in relation to improvement and learning. Uh, it's like we know it all already. We don't need, uh, 
Um, I, I know people who work for these companies where they have these great schemes. You learn four hours a week. Oh, we have a scheme. You learn four hours a week. You can read any book you want. You can go online. You can do this. You can do that. And then they give them 80 hours of work to do during the week. Do you know what I mean? They don't get four hours. That's the most difficult one. And also, I would say utilization is still a big problem. Uh, it, this whole idea that keeping people busy actually results in us getting less uh, outputs and ultimately less outcomes, that's quite difficult. Uh, I think one well, of the easy ones are, you know, you just do your minutes straight away. And actually, believe it or not, uh, planning based on throughput is actually the easiest thing to do because it's like, makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, okay, I can see what we did last year. So, yeah, that kind of makes sense. So, there's a bit of noise. Maybe it's a bit better this year. Maybe it's a bit worse, but that's kind of an easier message. Um, the other one I would say is commitment as a guarantee. Uh, so I'm very nervous of companies' object objectives and key results, for example, or they can be good in the right hands. They're mostly in the wrong hands. <laughs> and a commitment in OKRs means you move mountains. Uh, whereas with agility, where most of our people don't realize this, that OKRs have committed and aspirational ones. And most of them will be aspirational because we don't plan beyond the next couple of weeks or whatever, really. Um, so that's quite a difficult one. People thinking, oh, we know what we're going to do in the next quarter, really? I don't know what I'm doing next week. <laughs> so, does that help? Thank you so much, everyone. Very much. <laughs>